Within these walls lies the heart of the greatest military power since the days of Imperial Rome. The Pentagon, a symbol of glory and respect, a target of distrust and fear. You have to first and foremost make sure that you're the biggest dog on the block. The people within are charged with the defense of the United States, but their actions reach across the globe. The best protection we could possibly provide the American people is killing and destroying the people that would kill us. The Pentagon must act when called upon in complex times of uncertain outcome. If you're gonna put people's lives at risk, you better have a darn good reason. And you better know what that reason is. And you know why you're doing it. It must act despite the enormous consequences of its every move. It cannot stand still, for the world around it seethes with the fires of conflict and the tides of history. On a pristine morning in September of 2001, those tides reached the walls of the Pentagon, and it reeled as never before. There's just this atmospheric change that happens as that 757 breaks your airspace and slams into the side of your building. Just as the building was breached, so too was a sense of invulnerability. Not only must it rebuild, but also it must transform reinventing itself to combat the ever-changing threats of a new kind of war. More than any other institution I can think of in the world, the U.S. military's attention really has to be on all things at all times. They don't know where the next war is. This enigmatic place is the sum of many parts and many people. The Pentagon is more than just a building. It's almost like a living, breathing organism. It is an institution as complex as any on Earth, a place of war, power, and tradition. It is filled with history, and it is history-making. It is the extraordinary building known as the Pentagon. Young men have gone to war since civilization began. The United States has been called upon to send its people into battle again and again. For the last 60 years, the call to arms has come from inside the Pentagon. This is the home of the U.S. Defense Establishment, one of the largest institutions in human history. The Department of Defense and its armed services are headquartered here. Over 200,000 telephone calls will be made here today, and as many as 30,000 cups of coffee will be drunk. 4,200 clocks will tell time, and perhaps more than a million emails will be sent and received. At dawn, the halls begin to fill with a mix of military and civilians. There's a real rhythm to the building. It starts very early in the morning, 4, 4.30, and it tends to be uh, the military, the ones that show up the very earliest. And by 6, 6.30 in the morning, it is at full tilt. An extraordinary range of events takes place here on any given day. The Secretary of Defense will meet with a key foreign leader. One of the Pentagon's war rooms is buzzing with information from the battlefield. Thousands of miles away, the troops the Pentagon has deployed are putting their lives at risk. Where's that fire coming from? And for the first time since World War II, a young pilot searches for enemies in the skies above the Pentagon. At this crossroads of warriors, strategists, and bureaucrats, General Jack Keane, the Army's Vice Chief of Staff, has two major topics on his mind, his combat troops and the future of his service. The Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. All right, guys, grab a seat if you can. The Army is always evolving. 
And we're going through a period of our history where we're making some significant change, and we refer to that as transformation. Because when we look at future wars and the needs of the Army, we want to make some rather profound changes in the Army. And the question is, as we're going through time here on a go-to-war footing, would you rather invest in mobile assets, those things that can move around and put combat power on something, or fixed assets? And the clear choice is mobile assets right now, especially with the other two things that I talked about. Keene has his hands full, fighting battles in the conference room one minute and planning the real thing the next. He's standing in for his boss today in one of the Pentagon's most tightly secured rooms, where cameras are rarely allowed to go. This is the tank, the inner sanctum where the Joint Chiefs of Staff meet. They are the very top of the military food chain. The leaders of the armed services, Army, Navy, Marines and Air Force, advise the President and the Secretary of Defense from this room on all military actions. Usually those sessions are, are fairly restricted. We don't bring a lot of staff into those. Uh, by the time we get there, uh, we expect the, the service chiefs and, and myself and, uh, and General Pace, the vice chairman, to understand the issues. And we go in and we might get a briefing or a presentation by somebody. But then when we get into our serious deliberations, we just do that by ourselves. From behind this door, they reckon with the war in Afghanistan, one of the front lines in the global war on terrorism. The war the Pentagon is fighting is mostly an unconventional war. Special operations forces, small teams of highly trained, heavily equipped fighters were among the first to be flown in. Their job was to lay the groundwork for airstrikes and to organize the Afghan resistance. The basic unit that does that is a special forces A team. Um, there's 12 members on the team, all having specialties a weapons expert, a communications expert, a medical expert, and they all are used to culturally assimilating themselves in foreign countries. The elusive nature of the terrorist threat is demanding a radical shift in how the Pentagon is thinking about how it fights. We have not had to construct a global military strategy to deal with a threat since World War II, and that is very different than what our operations have been post-World War II. The new strategy must confront a constant from all battles past, the fog of war. Combat is a chaotic affair, and commanders don't necessarily know what is happening until after the smoke is cleared. A friend of mine used to compare that that fog of battle to playing a chess game, you know, literally in a fog where you not only can see very few of the opponent's chess pieces, but you can't even see all your own chess pieces. Now, as the Pentagon is pushing hard to transform 21st century warfare, stunning new technology may sweep away some of that fog for the first time in history. Night vision goggles allow soldiers to see more than 150 yards under nothing but starlight. High-powered weapons with the ability to hit a target from great distances are becoming the rule, not the exception. Even with military might unmatched anywhere in the world, no one is underestimating the task. This is very serious business. I've been in the military now almost 37 years. Uh, there's been nothing more important than we've been ever, ever been asked to do than this particular task. In Afghanistan, the Pentagon is waging a 21st century battle with a tribal culture. And technology alone will not ensure victory. Even in times of crisis, the Pentagon fights more than military battles. It must also wage a war of words. In the press office of the Secretary of Defense, the goal is to keep the message clear, consistent, and controlled. Yesterday in the morning shows, both the Vice President and the Deputy Secretary of Defense spoke about what's going to happen to those um, folks that are captured, either Taliban or Al-Qaeda. 
So we're just going to compare to see what the Vice President said versus what Deputy Secretary Wolf Wolfowitz said to make sure that we're being consistent. Today, the hottest topic is a tape that has surfaced of Osama bin Laden. The rumor is that it will be proof of his guilt in the massive September 11th attack. The press is clamoring for the tape, but the Pentagon and the White House are still coordinating how, when, and if it will happen. I don't know if the, if the tape will be done, but... Yeah. The back and forth discussions are held around a conference table set up appropriately enough for ping pong. When it's released, it'll be released. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't believe they are critical as to how this highly sensitive material will be handled. I Clark last night, uh, there's still some, the desire is that we release it within the Defense Department and we do it probably on Wednesday. My instinct is... Victoria Clark is the head spokesperson for Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. The secretary is holding a press conference in just a few hours and she has to be ready to brief him about the bin Laden tape. read it, it's pretty powerful on its own, so let's just let it stand out there by itself. I guess mine's more of a technical question though. Right. We've got these two transcripts now. Right. I'm just, well, we yeah. will at the end right. of the day have these uh -huh. two transcripts. What are we going to do with them? Well, we should reconcile them. Who are we going to be as as qualifies to be the adjudicator? See? I'll look at them. There. Okay. Yeah. For the, Can you get the two translators on the phone at the same time and have them come to some kind of agreement while you're talking through it? That way you can say that both translators agreed to this, this final version. That's a good idea. To, to this final version. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, these are all good things, but the more we add on, the subtext, mm -hmm. putting two translators together, right. we're adding a lot of time to when you, what's your but goal? But you're adding more credibility. Clark's next meeting will be with the secretary himself to advise him before he goes before the press, when he could be peppered with questions about the tape. Despite their mutual wariness, the Pentagon has made room for the press on its premises. We are, I think, probably the only Department of Defense or Ministry of Defense in the world in which the press corps is actually stationed here with us in the building, free to roam throughout the building. In their small offices, journalists like correspondent Jim Miklaszewski are prepping for another intense day. Miklaszewski has been covering the Pentagon on and off for more than 15 years. The Pentagon itself has about 17 and a half miles of quarters. And to get news out of this building for beat reporters, you have to walk seemingly every inch of those 17 and a half miles. Uh, because much of the information that we're dealing with uh, is information that cannot be conveyed uh, over the telephone for various reasons. Some of it is classified. And so you really have to sit down and meet face to face with people. And that requires quite a bit of legwork on our part. The hallways of the Pentagon seem endless which in fact they are. There are more than six million square feet here, divided into five equal wedges. The entire capital could fit inside any one of them. There are five concentric rings, labeled from A to E. The rings are connected by 10 corridors, which make it extremely efficient for getting from one place to another. Some 23,000 people work here. Once they arrive, many don't leave for the whole day. They don't have to. This is a world unto itself. The Pentagon offers many of the services and amenities found in any small town. It's an amazing building, and it's an amazing family. There are some 23,000 people here, and it's extraordinary how in a very short time you get to know a lot of them and different hallways are, are like the neighborhoods. One area of the building is unreachable these days, though. The three outermost rings between corridors four and five. Nearly 400,000 square feet were damaged in the September 11th attack. The funny thing about mornings like September 11th are they start off like any other day of the week. You deal with the hassles of traffic, with all of the regular hassles of living in a large metropolitan area and trying to get to work. 
I was sitting at my desk, uh, a friend had called uh, from Fort Belvoir, about 10 miles south of the Pentagon, and she was asking if I had heard about what happened uh, to the World Trade Centers, and of course I had, and she jokingly told me, you know, the Pentagon is probably next, you ought to get out, and it was just at that moment uh, that you just felt and heard the plane impact the side of the Pentagon. It was 9.38 a.m., and the building was in full swing when the plane hit at close to 350 miles an hour. I saw that plane coming right at me, but he, he picked up a little bit as he, he wanted to put himself right in a window on the first floor. And the plane came right over top of me. I could see all the windows on the right side going by. There's just this atmospheric change that happens as that 757 breaks your airspace and slams into the side of your building. It's like a whoosh. The flash, uh, the tearing of the metal, the ripping of the wood, the, it's the force that hits you. There was a sudden noise, a sound as if there was an earthquake. And there is this vacuum that happens, and you can hear the explosion the same time that you're feeling it in the core of your body. But just as the lights went out, I was looking at an officer who was uh, across the table from me, and I was confused because debris was also falling, and I wasn't sure whether or not the debris fell on one of the two people who were sitting near me. We have an airplane that crashed into the Pentagon. The plane slammed into sections of wedges one and two, largely occupied by Army and Navy personnel. David Thayall and Carl Monken shared an office barely more than 30 yards away from the point of impact. I was blown about 20 feet into the, the, the remnants of the office next door, but it, it wasn't as though I was this lone trajectory flying through the walls. I mean, everything just gave way. There was a lot of smoke. It was very putrid black smoke, and it was burning the lungs. It hurt to breathe. The vacuum caused by the explosion just sucks the air right out of you, so you're you take a breath and you don't, you almost hate to breathe in because you know what you're getting into. And so you know that you have a limited amount of time uh, to get out of there. When I landed, I still had the phone in my hands because I remember doing a double take as I looked at the phone and dropped it. And in an instant, you realize that you're in, in basically entombed or entrapped and all the stuff that's been thrown on you, your cubicle, your desk, you're still in your chair and then immediately the the call for uh, your awareness that you still have your buddy thank goodness is alive He's saying Carl Carl five times are you okay the desk and everything else came with me and it just deflected the fireball the fireball passed right over me we knew we had to get out trying to find our bearings we need to go this way but we had no direction we had no sense of origin because the walls were gone it was just absolute and total destruction and we were just grabbing anything that was hanging from the, from the ceiling, wires that were hanging, those thin metal strips which hold up the ceiling tiles, just anything to help ourselves over the rubble. And then it looked as if they turned around, and then I turned back around and yelled, where are you? And the voice said, come through the light. So I trusted the voice and trusted what I thought was the light and went through. In the Building Operations Command Center, known as the Bach, which monitors the physical plant, 355 fire alarms went off at once. Staff scrambled to turn off damaged electrical circuits, carrying nearly 14,000 volts of electricity. There was water all over the floor that if a cable had gotten into it, it could have you know, caused another electrocution or extreme electric shock to other people. Just about at that time, I believe, is when they notified of the additional airplanes. Uh, if I recall right, they called three additional airplanes inbound to the Pentagon, uh, and they gave us an ETA of about 25 minutes. The box staff remained at their Pentagon posts, braced for more attacks. The day was far from over. Not long after the fires finally subsided, the restoration effort began. The man who is leading the charge is Lee Evey. He has found himself in a historic place and time. What you see happening here is the beginning of the reconstruction of the Pentagon's damaged area, what we call the Phoenix area. 
Uh, and it's our intent to have this area rise from the ashes just like the fabled Phoenix. The construction crews have thrown themselves into their mission. They work around the clock every day, including weekends, no matter what the weather or the emotional toll. We've taken it as our goal that at the one-year anniversary of September 11th, that we will have people on the E-ring, that outermost ring, sitting in their offices, behind their furniture, doing their work, and watching that commemorative ceremony for the inside of the building out. And, and we will achieve that goal. We're trying to put the pieces back together as fast as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Evie and his team are working under an intense deadline that echoes that of the building's original creation. <laughs> The Pentagon construction started on September 11th, 1941. So it was 60 years exactly to the day that this crash took place. In the months before ground was broken for the Pentagon, it was clear that for the U.S., war was imminent. Europe was already in battle. It was an anxious time in the nation's capital. In Washington, the War Department was dispersed throughout the city, perhaps 17 different buildings, and it became quite clear this is not an efficient way to do business. The man who would be behind the new building was General Brehan Somerville, Chief of Construction for the War Department. Somerville was a pile-driving man. He was a very strong, forceful character, ruthless, determined, and because he was very effective in getting things done, even though he was unpopular and even disliked by many of the people who knew him and worked for him or with him, he had the support of his superiors. In the heat of a Washington summer evening, on Thursday, July 17th, Somerville ordered a small group of engineers and architects to draw up a plan for a fireproof, air-conditioned building that could hold an unprecedented 40,000 people. It would be the world's biggest office building. Amazingly, on Monday morning, plans were submitted for a five-sided building which harked back to the pentagonal shape of many old forts. The new fortress would be in northern Virginia, just across the Potomac River from Washington, which had little room for such a huge structure. At one point, President Roosevelt wanted a building with no windows, perhaps for safety reasons. But munitions experts told him that without them, a bomb would do far greater damage. Though the plan changed more than once, the shape never did. Less than two months after its conception, construction began. Even with 4,000 men working three shifts, progress was sluggish. At this rate, it would have taken eight more years to complete the Pentagon. Then came December 7th, 1941. There are a number of reasons why Pearl Harbor took people by surprise the way it did. And I think for Americans in December 1941, as indeed in September of uh, 2001, there was something shocking about the site, about this beautiful day being suddenly marred by an attack which seemed to come from nowhere, which left thousands of people dead, which involved an enormous amount of graphic destruction. Spurred on by the attack, construction shifted into overdrive. The Pentagon would be built in only 16 months. They used 15,000 workers. They worked 24 hours a day, and they got all six and a half million square feet completed in 16 months. By the following spring, people were already installed in the unfinished building. That May, the government declared the building would be called the Pentagon. In the dark days of World War II, there was no special ceremony to commemorate the Pentagon's completion. People continued to move into the building 24 hours a day at the rate of about a thousand a week. They were engaged in a mission and thousands of miles away, so were the armed forces.
Throughout three and a half years of war, the Pentagon supported the troops and saw them through to victory. It had been proposed that the Mammoth Building could become a storage facility after the war. But by 1945, the Pentagon had become as immutable a symbol of Washington as the Capitol. A few years later, the War Department had become the Department of Defense, and the Pentagon was its permanent home. Over the decades, hundreds of thousands of people have walked these halls. For newcomers, it can be like traveling to a foreign country with its own customs and language. 1300 to walk through all five of those plus the POs to present the path forward to OT for MCS, FPCB2, and ISISCON. The PO will also present the path forward to the IV OT. And I remember going to a budget briefing. <laughs> and I remember the briefer put up a slide uh, with type about the size of the stock tables uh, in the back of the paper. This slide jammed with letters, and I'm trying to read it, and they kept talking about I can't remember what the acronym was, but they kept using this term you know, the, 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 the spam jam or whatever it was. And that's what it sounded like to me. So finally I turned to this, I thought, I am the only one in the room who doesn't get this and I feel like an idiot. So I turned over to this four star and I said, sir, what's the spam jam? And he said, I haven't the faintest idea. So I didn't feel so totally lost. Eliminate it. Now, As a former journalist, Israel, Pete Williams went from outsider to insider to when he became the Pentagon spokesperson in 1989. Are now operational. Like many people who did not serve in the military, I had this cliche view of people in uniform. If you go to any community in America and ask yourself, who's running the blood drive? Who's running the toys for TOTS program? It's going to be people in the military. The enormous esprit de corps of the military, it runs through the Pentagon, it goes through the pipes in the building, it runs through the electrical current, it's in the air. So it is a very impressive thing that you'll never forget. The Pentagon has no more important mission than supporting the troops. Providing them with good training and sophisticated equipment has always been critical. But it is especially true now, as the military's mandate evolves with the times. The United States military is preparing for the entire range of conflict, from peacekeeping to nuclear warfare, across the entire range of climates, and across the entire range of cultures. It is a very large military, really trying to be all things to all people, and doing it pretty successfully. Many of the men and women who make up the American military refer to themselves as warriors. They are an essential element in the defense equation of the United States. The U.S. military approach classically has been overwhelming force, overwhelming destructive power brought to bear against the enemy. But the young fighters the Pentagon deploys need discipline as well as firepower. In the modern military, they can be asked to keep the peace as well as to wage war. It is a duty that may not come naturally. Remember, we train a soldier, as, as brutal as it sounds, is to kill, to use force violently. You have taken an 18-year-old in whom you have drilled in that when you come to a point of resistance, you hit with all the violence at your disposal to get through that resistance. The human factor in war will remain unpredictable. But the Pentagon is always looking for ways to increase the odds in its favor. It's a process fraught with both pitfalls and promise. In the Army, one new fighting tool is slated for deployment in 2003. It's called the Land Warrior. After initial failure, the hope now is that it will transform the nature of combat. We are on the cusp of the era of the smart soldier. Land Warrior is designed to keep soldiers safer 
and make them more lethal. At its heart is a small computer hooked up to a head-mounted display. The soldier can control both a thermal weapons site and a video camera with the device. But it does much more. Right now, this soldier is looking at a map. It not only shows where his troops are, it shows where the enemy may be hiding. It takes the guesswork out of navigation. You know, you don't have to pull out a map and protractor and try to plot where you're at, try to figure out. You don't have to intersection, resection. The system enables the fighter to communicate with others by voice or email, rather than shouts or hand signals. Land Warrior also expands the capability of weaponry. It allows soldiers to fire more accurately in the dark using a thermal weapons sight. They can even shoot from cover without exposing themselves to return fire because they can see the target in the head-mounted display. It enhances our survivability for the fact that we can shoot around corners from inside of foxholes. And the video camera can take digital pictures of targets, which can be instantly transmitted to fellow soldiers in combat or to commanders who may be miles away. Land Warrior is not ready for use, but some of its technology has already been deployed. In the new century, war will continue to look, sound, and unfold differently. More, perhaps, than at any other time in history. Pentagon Warriors come in all manner of disguise. Some are dead ringers for civilians. I took myself out of the field, out of the battle dress uniform, the muddy boots, where I spent my whole career in the woods, basically transformed overnight, set the uniform aside, put on the civilian clothes, uh, grew my hair long, and tried to blend in as much as possible. Lieutenant Colonel Ted Anderson has seen combat more than once. His Pentagon persona is Congressional Liaison, a lobbyist who fights for the Army's budget. Well, Brady doesn't know what we're at. Okay, I'll let Brady and let go another. The Pentagon's funding has often been a source of no small amount of controversy, a wash in politics and charges of recurring excess. The promise to put, to put DRF money... Uh, With figures sometimes topping 15% of the federal budget, defense spending can come under heavy fire. This time around, though, post 9-11, criticism seems muted. It is Congress that has the final say in just how much money the Pentagon will get. Anderson's responsibility is to see that the Army's leaders are ready to answer questions from members who may have their own agendas for military spending. It's General Jack Keane's turn in the hot seat. Anderson is there to back him up. The colonel has served under Keene at three different posts over the years. General Keene is, is a no-nonsense, hard-nosed soldier who grew up in New York, and um, soldiers intuitively are drawn to General Keene because he is a soldier soldier. The unfunded requirements were $8.7 billion. Back at the Pentagon, young MPs from Keene's old command, Fort Bragg, have been deployed to guard it since the September 11th attack. The vice chief of staff makes time to visit them. After all, they're his troops. You guys doing all right? Just fine, sir. That's great seeing you. Oh, hey, guys, how are you? Good, good, sir. Good, good, good to see you. You all doing okay? Good, good, sir. Good morning, guys. All right, we've been here since 20 September, thereabouts? Right, sir. Yeah. As much as you want to stay a field soldier forever, it's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is also to come here to the headquarters of the greatest military in the world and provide the talent and the experience that you have and, and hopefully some insightful judgment as well to help those in the field. So you, you, you feel good about being here. It's not like jumping out of airplanes with soldiers at night and riding in helicopters with them. 
My life in the past was an association with soldiers, sergeants, and I missed that association, no doubt about it. But being here is the right thing to do. And thanks for what you're doing out here. I mean, you know how important this is. This is a battlefield here. We already know that. I mean, we've had 184 people killed here. On that terrible day in September, in the midst of the chaos, some of the building operations staff had voluntarily stayed behind, despite warnings that more terrorist strikes were on the way. We divided into two groups, three of us on each side of the center courtyard in case something happened, there, we would still be, there would be a group still there, hopefully. They had acted to close off vents filled with suffocating smoke and keep computer systems critical to the national defense up and running. Because the building was not being fully evacuated, we still had numerous people at the Secretary of Defense and some of our military command centers that were staying operational. We had to be able to provide them with water, with uh, air conditioning and other things during the time the fire was still going on. We had just been attacked and at that point we were at war, so we needed to keep our military command centers fully operational. Several miles away, a young Air National Guard pilot had been called back urgently from a training mission. Low on fuel, he was told to take off again immediately from Andrews Air Force Base. Captain, I want to watch your boat, your radar. And first, to be totally honest with you, I didn't know what I was going to do because I wasn't being told anything. There's nothing on my radar because there were no other airplanes flying. Everything had been immediately grounded from their present location. Uh, on top of all that, there was no radio chatter. Normally you hear lots and lots of uh, aircraft talking, the air traffic controllers talking. It's dead silence. On the ground, Ted Anderson was transforming from a lobbyist back into a field soldier. The Pentagon was under attack. My fellow soldiers needed aid. And, it, you know, it's like combat. And this is what you train for your whole life. A non-commissioned officer named Chris Brainerd joined him in the frantic efforts to get the trapped and injured out. As I ran up to him, I introduced myself and said, Sergeant Brayman, uh, nice to meet you. He said, hi, Ted Anderson. My general got out on his watch. I'm not going to let him die. When we got right up to the building itself, right at the point of impact, uh, as close as we could manage because the ball of fire and the flames were just, I mean, they were incredible. We found one of the windows in the older part of the building that had been blown out from the blast. We boosted each other through the window, climbed into the building, and tried to get down ab about five to ten feet to push open an emergency exit door so we could possibly, you know, allow people to run out to, to escape. There we noticed a woman. She was clapping. She couldn't, uh, she couldn't breathe. She, she, couldn't, she couldn't speak, but she was just clapping her hands, trying to, trying to get it and all that stuff, but we could barely see her. We reached in and got her and pulled her out. We pulled her out, pulled her uh, away from the building, and gave her to some other folks, and they carried her away. Many were under the assumption that still more enemy-controlled aircraft were approaching the Pentagon. Be aware that there were two plane crashes in New York, and there were 15 engine five, engine When I was in the center courtyard tunnel, the building had been evacuated because the other inbound airplanes, and they were still calling our time to arrival. About that time, it was about five minutes to the inbound planes were to arrive. About that time is when a military aircraft with very evident rockets or missiles on the wings flew over top of the Pentagon uh, at a very high rate of speed. At that point, I did not know what had happened, that it was an aircraft that had hit the Pentagon. I thought it was a, a bomb of some sort, because as I'm passing by it once leaving Andrews, I can see obviously there had been some sort of explosion or detonation. I knew from the point that plane went across that nothing, no other plane was going to come and get to the Pentagon. I was given the order that uh, should I need to defend the Capitol against some enemy, foreign or domestic, uh, I had the power to do use whatever force necessary. Local emergency services were on the scene, working to get the injured out and move everyone to safety. Inside, the fires raged threatening the lives of rescuers and the trapped alike. NCNI ran back into the building, 
And this time, one of the cars closest to us blew up outside. It scared me to death and knocked me down inside onto the floor. And in getting up, um, I noticed this bright flash go by me, this orange flash. And I, I was afraid, that, um, I mean, I covered myself because I was afraid perhaps it was part of the, the ceiling caving in or something. Um, and you couldn't see anything else for the smoke, just, just this bright glow. And whatever it was ran by me and bounced off the window and then bounced back down on the ground. It was, it was a person. Uh, the front of this person was on fire, and he was trying to get out to that window. We tackled him, smothered the flames, and he's, he is so pumped up on adrenaline now, he's screaming the whole time, go get the people out in the corridor. There are people behind me. Please go get the people in the corridor. We carried him all the way out, handed him off to somebody else, and that's when we ran back again and tried to get through the door, and we were stopped by the firemen. We wanted to get in there. We knew at first hand what we had saw inside. If we didn't hurry up and get back in there, there wasn't going to be anybody else left. Um, because we, you could see uh, people burning in the, in the windows. We have an unwritten code in the military that states uh, you will never leave anybody behind. Whether you're, you're injured or whether you're dead, you will never be left. You will always be brought out. And this was a combative situation, you know, you had all the sounds and the smells of combat, you know, you had the screams and the cries and the death and the wounded, um, but yet Although the fire department was doing their job, and I'm glad they did, we had to leave our comrades behind. And I, I know uh, that in my heart we could have probably got them back, or I was going to at least die trying to get them. Later, uh, the, one of the battalion fire chiefs told me that they had found 15 bodies stacked up inside on, in the corridor. And in. I try not to dwell on it. I can only imagine that these were the people that this gentleman was talking about and that they were trying to get out and, you know, perhaps their way was blocked. I, I just don't know. It seemed inconceivable that such a thing had happened. And in an instant, it had changed the Pentagon forever. This was a new kind of threat but the Pentagon had faced other crises in its past. In its time, the Pentagon has experienced both triumph and disaster. Some 30 years earlier, it was rocked by a very different war than the one that is waging now. No era was more difficult or damaging than Vietnam. The after effects are still being felt. There's a sort of never again mentality inside the US military that's been passed down through generations of officers about Vietnam. I'm not sure it's always the right lesson, but boy, that lesson still looms very large in the US military. Vietnam was like nothing the Pentagon had ever encountered. What had begun as an effort to stop the spread of communism became a trap from which there seemed no escape. American officers felt enormous pressure to succeed, which led to frustration and ultimately a great deal of deception. Washington could only make decisions on what was getting back from the field. And one of the things that quite clearly happened, what I would describe as the corruption of data as it passed up the chain of command a lieutenant would file his after action report and it would look sunnier and sunnier and sunnier as it went to division headquarters, to regional headquarters, to Saigon, to the Pentagon, to the president. The war dragged on and on, taking the Pentagon down with it. 
Some in the once proud defense establishment felt betrayed by an administration that seemed unable to extricate itself from the nightmare. The basic belief that seems to be pervasive in the U.S. military is that civilians meddled in the Vietnam War, that the lesson of Vietnam was that the politicians got too involved in the basic decisions about the war. Outside the Pentagon, public fury was increasing. The protests reached right up to the walls of the building itself. There was disillusionment within the ranks as well. Those might to some sound like harsh words. But at some point, the leadership of our country understood perfectly clearly that this war could not be won in Vietnam. And yet they continued to send in young men and women to die and went to bed at night and slept well. And I hope to God we never do this again. And I think everyone who is a civilian leader whose job it is to send young men and women into harm's way um, better look themselves in the mirror every night and say, have I sent them knowing that they cannot win, that they're going there for naught. And I think in this country this occurred. In 1975, when it all finally ended, the credibility of the Pentagon was in tatters. At its lowest point, the youngest Secretary of Defense ever was sworn in, 43-year-old Donald Rumsfeld. Everything suffered during the Vietnam War. It was the era of guns and butters both, and, and in fact, the guns suffered because all, everything in the military invested in went for Vietnam. The other thing was there had been demonstrations here and the various people throwing blood in the front steps and that type of thing. The building had been closed. They'd never had any public tours, and, and they turned off every other light as you went down the halls in this building, and it was a dark, dreary, uh, not a happy place to be. So I decided what we ought to do is turn the lights back on, have public tours, and dedicate some corridors to oh, NATO and other groups or activities or people who've contributed to the defense establishment over the decades. Now, after more than 20 years in private life, Rumsfeld is back with a new mission. The Pentagon is not always known for flexibility or efficiency, but he wants to change that. The effort has been clouded by the events of the 11th, however. When there's a war, one has to spend a great deal of time on the war. So since 9-11, uh, I suppose a major chunk of my days uh, involved with the global war on terrorism and, and in many instances, Afghanistan. Right. Part of the Pentagon's reputation rides on how they handle information about the war. In a few moments, Secretary Rumsfeld will appear before the press, who will want to know about, among other things, the bin Laden tape. It has already been characterized, portions of it. Has anyone seen pretty it outside of the government? I don't think anyone outside the government has seen it yet, but there's been some pretty heavy characterization of it. And now there's real interest in when are you going to release it. Has the White House indicated? That for sure that it's going to be released? They have indicated they expect it to be released soon, but they haven't put a date on it or a time or anything. Should we go? Yes, sir. He'll have to wing it. No firm decision has been reached. Where are the leadership? Same question. If we do a good job of telling the people the truth about our circumstance in the world, uh, that it's a dangerous world, it's an untidy world, that weapons are more powerful, their reach is greater, uh, but that we as a country are determined to see that we can continue to live as free people in this world, and we can do it. This country, more than any country on the face of the earth, can do that. See, they got you working again? Good to have you. God bless you. I love you. Good. Keep going. Yes, sir. <laughs> You're a secret. You're not going to run out of things to do. No, indeed. we got a lot to do. Rumsfeld, more than any other secretary I've covered, and I've covered about four or five now, really has imposed his will on the Pentagon in a striking way. He's very brusque, he's very straightforward, he's not afraid to take people on, and he kind of has also a little bit of a frat boy Princeton towel snapping attitude to him. Um, not afraid to josh a little bit. <laughs> I 
I think we'd best uh, delay the punchline. Uh, the joshing ends quickly morning. when the subject of the tape comes up. Various people trying to uh, translate that and, and understand precisely what was said. Uh, and uh, whether or not it'll be released or when uh, is, is a question for some others than me. But, but uh, if it is, it will be released with some uh, translations. That, that in consultation with the White House, the Pentagon released the tape said, two days later. The translations were criticized, but the Pentagon stood by its version. And after all the effort and debate, the matter was all but forgotten in a few short weeks. One hundred eighty-four victims at the Pentagon site were among the thousands of lives lost that September day. It was a life-changing moment for many of the people close to the event. For one, it had a tragic irony as well. It's right at the dividing line between Lee Evie had been heading up an overhaul of the entire Pentagon for nearly four years. That gives them a lot more. A former NASA contract negotiator, this was his first construction job, and it was the biggest federal renovation project in U.S. history. It was desperately needed. The building was in terrible shape. But in September, his task was suddenly transformed. We were just completing on September 11th, the last of what we call wedge one. The renovation above ground consists of five wedges. Each wedge is a chevron shape of about one million square feet. We were about five days from its completion and we were moving people from wedge two into wedge one. The renovation was much more than cosmetic. The windows may not look that unusual, but each one weighs close to a ton. It's an exact replica of the original, but its glass is two inches thick. It's built as a replica of the historic window that was here previously. So if you look at the window from the outside of the building, it looks exactly like the window that it replaced, including the handle. Uh, and the little clips that uh, would put a screen in, etc. But in reality, the window is not designed to ever open. It'll always be closed for two things. First, it's to serve as a, a blast inhibitor. Okay? And second, uh, in case of nuclear, or biological, or chemical attack, you don't want to have the windows in the building open. In a twist of fate, Flight 77 hit the Pentagon in the most protected place possible. The renovation and the windows saved lives like that of the man who was leaning against his new fourth floor window when the plane hit the building directly beneath him. He was thrown across the room uh, when the aircraft impacted the building, got up in time to see uh, the large fireball and the explosion uh, from, from the aircraft, and, uh, and he was very fearful that, uh, that he was going to be badly hurt because of the force of the explosion. And, and indeed, uh, the building shook and, and the window shook, uh, but the window didn't even have a crack in it. Uh, and he walked over, opened the doorknob, and, and walked out of the building. That day, most survivors stumbled home exhausted. But thousands of people reported for work at the Pentagon the next day, even while the fires continued to burn. Terrorists have demonstrated they're willing to take their own lives. They're willing to fly airplanes filled with hundreds of people into buildings and into this building, the Pentagon. Uh, they also have demonstrated an enormous desire to get weapons of mass destruction. Uh, they have been actively trying to get chemical and biological and nuclear and radiation weapons. If they get them, uh, and there, there's no question but that they're willing to use them. With such threats to the mainland, the Pentagon is assuming domestic responsibilities it never asked for. Homeland security patrols are underway just off American shores. 
an unheard of concept on this scale since the days of World War II. Maritime Homeland Security uh, mission is to find and stop terrorist activities trying to get inside the country. Specifically looking for weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, radiological, biological, chemical, or other large explosive devices that can cause uh, damage uh, and casualties on a mass scale. God forbid we, we find a ship that's actually got some sort of large destructive device and then and our job is to stop it and get control of it and go from there. As part of a joint Navy Coast Guard mission, a foreign registered freighter has been chosen for a random check to be performed by the Coast Guard crew aboard the USS Thunderbolt. Morning, Cap. This is your Coast Guard Lieutenant Len Robinson makes contact with the vessel. May I have the spelling of your vessel's name, Captain? Uh, yeah, of course. It's Mike Alpha Alpha. The armed services are prohibited from carrying out law enforcement. The Coast Guard, which is under the Department of Transportation, will execute that part of the job. We're going to go on and verify his claim, nationality, and verify his crew registry and his cargo that he's carrying in support of Homeland Security. Motor vessel from Radio, Motor vessel from Radio. This is U.S. Coast Guard. Over. Roger, Captain. We're going to be sitting our boarding team over at this time. Uh, request that you have your crew mustered in the salon. Make sure they have their passport, visa, and your crew manifest available for my boarding team. Uh, we'll be embarking your vessel on the port side. We need no assistance. Over. Our main concern right now would be uh, unaccounted for personnel, personnel that are hiding on board, and the cargo. We like to position ourselves in such a location to where we, we have good fields of fire and we can provide cover for the guys that are coming on and off these ships. You know, and if, if, if need be, depending on the on the vessel and what their actions demonstrate that they're willing to do or capable of doing, you know, we're certainly capable of providing our own self-protection as well as uh, covering the insertion or extraction of a, of a friendly force from that, from that ship. But, uh, you know, I, I, I prefer to, uh, you know, if we, can, if we can do our job, do what we have to do without ever firing a shot, I think that's, uh, that's the best way to do business. The boarding squad discovered problems. A crew member with no documents, an unlisted and hazardous cargo. He didn't have documentation for the cargo he was carrying. He was carrying, he was carrying ammonium sulfate, which is hazardous cargo. Uh, and also, one of his crew members, uh, he didn't have a visa. He wasn't on the manifest, but his brother was on there. It's just the kind of thing that they worry about. The crew discrepancies, plus the 3,800 metric tons of a toxic industrial chemical, are reported up the chain of command. The decision comes back. The freighter will not be allowed to continue and will be escorted out to sea, past U.S. waters. With nearly 100,000 miles of shoreline and some 10,000 ships entering U.S. waters each day, the Thunderbolt faces a daunting assignment. However, the task of homeland security is unlikely to go away. At the Pentagon itself, there have been radical security changes since September 11th. Once a remarkably open place, it has severely tightened its stance. The DPS, the Defense Protective Service, verifies IDs and passports regularly if anything is out of place, entrance is denied. This morning, the DPS has seen something they don't like in one of the 67 acres of parking. An envelope has been thrown out of a car. The situation going on in lane 13 right now. Somebody drives up in a car, possibly a Dodge Shadow. Pulls up, drops a vanilla envelope in the middle of the lane, and then takes off down to DC. The envelope is lying just yards away from the building. Inside, the Protective Service Unit, the Pentagon's equivalent of the Secret Service, is already on high alert. If you got any concerns about people walking up, make sure we get with the gates. Three of the most important people in the country are expected here in about an hour. All right, today we got a uh, luncheon that's dealing with the uh, vice president, 
um, Secretary of State Colin Powell and um, Condoleezza Rice, uh, security advisor. Uh, myself and Van, we're going to be outside on the plaza. While the Protective Service Unit is prepping for the arrival of the VIPs, the Fort Bragg MPs are called in to cordon off the area around the package. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Colonels Ted Anderson and Ron Ellis are headed out to the hill for another hearing. But they are about to run into a problem. Are we locked in? Yes. That's not good. The Pentagon is frozen. No one can go in or out. There's an incident outside. We're going to make that adjustment because of what's going on on the other side of the building. And when we finish with that, maybe something else will come about, or maybe another suspicious package, but we'll deal with that when it comes up. The VIPs are expected shortly. Secretary of State Colin Powell is scheduled to arrive first. And we're going to make sure that they get here on time without uh, any problems or anything. And we're going to secure the area, sanitize the vehicles, the grounds, and the uh, local public if we have to, to make this happen. And it'll take about 60 minutes. But this 60 minutes has cost us probably about two days of work. In the parking lot, a bomb squad from nearby Fort McNair has been called in to investigate. One of their first steps will be to x-ray the package. The DPS control center has its hands full, literally. Main 13. Now you these and route, okay? On one side of the Pentagon, three of the country's leaders are about to arrive for a high-level meeting. On the other, a bomb expert is analyzing a package for explosive devices. Detonating it could be dangerous if there is a toxic substance inside. We were out waiting on the bus. They told us to come back in a quarter or two, and they locked the door as they finished the incident. And then when that's done, they'll let us out, but we don't have a clue. We might be able to go out the metro entrance, and, but for as far as the buses are concerned, the cops aren't seeing no harm. Like two hours. They didn't or... tell us. Cases okay, so like this could be 10 minutes, it could be two hours. There were rumors of unidentified residue on the envelope, but it is pronounced free of both residue and explosives. Powell arrives safely and disappears into the Pentagon that he once commanded as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. We don't want the, our, our principals standing outside in harm's way for any length of time over 60 seconds. And in the same regards, we don't want the other principal waiting over 60 seconds or what we would call stopped, which is on the X. When you're on the X, you're a target. So we want to keep the wheels rolling, keep the feet moving. So when the vehicles come up to the steps, the secretary's there, they shake hands, they come in, and the operation goes off smoothly. If everybody has to wait, then someone that's lurking outside has a good chance of setting up a good shot. We don't want that to happen. By the time everyone arrives, the package has been cleared. But the DPS's job is not over. They looked in there briefly. There were some papers and some paper clips. They looked in there and they saw there could be something that possibly could have been addressed to the president. Uh, I cannot tell you for an absolute, but it was rambling writings, nothing specific. The incident resolved, everyone is allowed to go about their business, including Ted Anderson and Ron Ellis. Moments like this one are a reminder that life at the Pentagon will never be the same. A new sign has been put up outside the Phoenix Project, counting down the days till its completion. The familiar limestone facade is going up, protected from the weather by plastic sheeting. We're ahead of schedule at this point, probably about four weeks ahead of schedule. And of course, that schedule was already quite ambitious. The construction crews have shown great dedication to the Phoenix Project, rarely taking even short breaks. But one of them is here for the most personal of reasons. Michael Flacco is a sheet metal worker from Delaware. 
He requested special permission from his union to work on the job. It was all he could think to do. His son, a Navy weather forecaster, was killed in this very spot on September 11th. To be able to put together something that was destroyed, it gives you a feeling that, that, that about as close as you can get to having him back alive again. I, I retrace his footsteps every day through the uh, Army-Navy tunnel. He used to walk through there every day. So I go there every day and walk past. He was probably at his desk, and uh, the plane came through the first floor, right through Naval Ops, and uh, hopefully he never knew what hit him. The planes and the, uh, the heat were so intense that uh, it just melted some of the structure up above and caused a collapse right over in here. And, uh, Fortunately, we got him back. We got a whole body back. I was able to hold, touch his hair. There is more being rebuilt here than walls and corridors. While the renovation project forges ahead, the work of the national defense continues around it. We can't allow uh, the mission of the Department of Defense to stop or to fail for one minute out of one day because we're here doing the renovation. We have to keep those people constantly doing their work. The mission of the Pentagon is carried out by thousands of people doing millions of different tasks. But no part is more essential than planning for war. There are people right now over at the Pentagon thinking about what if A happens? Could we do B? What Might we do C? Might we do D? And they're writing all those plans up. The Pentagon is full of contingencies and plans for things that you and I have never even thought might happen. That's their jobs. In 1990, a plan was being devised in the Air Force that would help change the face of war fighting. It was brewing in a small Pentagon think tank, or cell, named Checkmate. It was led by Colonel John Warden, who wanted to open up the sometimes musty Pentagon to new ideas. The old way of thinking about war was very much of thinking that war was a clash of two armies or air forces or navy. And what became fairly clear as we're moving into the mid-1980s was that that was much, much too small a view of warfare. So the concept of the enemy as a system was to think about an enemy as a something that was significantly greater than just the military side of it. The Checkmate team put theory into practice when the Gulf War loomed. They devised a plan for an operation which would target the country's infrastructure as well as its military. It was a rock that would be on the receiving end. Very early on, this whole team said, wow, we've got something that's really powerful. And, and then that feeling maintained itself through the planning and then through the war itself. The plan was possible in part because of innovations in the American arsenal. Precision weapons guided by lasers and able to hit with far greater accuracy than weapons of the past. In World War II, for example, if we wanted to have a very high probability of hitting a, a, a target, you had to drop 9,000 bombs to have a 90% probability. In the Gulf War, with the precision bombs, one bomb gave you that same probability that took 9,000 bombs in World War II. So what that meant was that we could hit a lot more targets with a lot fewer airplanes. Within a few days of beginning the air campaign, the Iraqis were stunned by what Warden called parallel attack. And parallel attack meant that many, many things happened to Iraq at the same time, which induced a state of paralysis, which was almost impossible for the Iraqis to deal with. It's sort of a thousand-year flood problem. You simply can't prepare for that kind of a thing. Precision weapons and the strategic use of air power helped make the Gulf War an enormous operational victory for the Pentagon helping it move past the legacy of Vietnam. Desert Storm worked extremely well because the U.S. military learned the tactical lessons of the Vietnam War. They really went to school on how do we fight better, how do we connect, tr how we train to how we fight. 
The evolution in many kinds of military technology has roared forward since then. But predicting the future is a tough game to play. There's an enormous tension in the development of military technology between sticking with what you know worked because it worked in the last war and coming up with something new because you might need it in the next war. There can be decades of lag time between concept and execution of weapon systems. And what can seem like a good idea mid-decade can be outdated and a waste of billions a few years later. The debate over how the Pentagon spends its money rises up periodically, often fueled by a bad decision or a failed mission. Still, smart weapons are becoming smarter and smarter. Satellite-guided weapons with GPS technology are the latest thing. This is a representation of a state-of-the-art air-to-surface satellite-guided cruise missile in development by the Air Force. As it closes in on its target, an infrared imaging seeker takes over. It rarely misses. Even more traditional weapons are being updated to meet new threats. The thermobaric bomb, known as a bunker buster, is designed to suck the oxygen out of caves and anyone inside them as well. Much of the reality of war has been kept distant from the public during the operation in Afghanistan, but that does not make the weapons any less lethal. Hardware alone is not enough for the Pentagon to win its wars. It also needs friends. Today at the Pentagon, allies from 29 countries have arrived to demonstrate their support for the war on terrorism. The Pentagon will not release the exact number of countries with an American troop presence, but they are stationed in at least two-thirds of the world's nations. The troops are there at the pleasure of the host countries. In this new age, international cooperation is as essential as it has ever been. Still, the Pentagon is a uniquely American institution. And if the military is not democratic, it is still filled with many voices and many different interests. Think of the Pentagon as a village out there somewhere, or a little tribal group of tribes out there. Power resides in money at the Pentagon, and money is held by the Office of the Secretary of Defense, but it's kind of an embattled little group up on top of the hill. And then running around it are three or four different warring tribes. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, all kind of circling around it, whooping around it, kind of going after this embattled little group that has all the money and seeking their money. And occasionally those tribes get together and gang up on the Office of the Secretary of Defense. More often, they just fight with each other. The fight may be for recognition or for dollars or to be the ones chosen for an impending operation. This is not combat, though. This is North Carolina. It's a display of marine firepower meant to impress and entertain. You'll see all the capabilities that the Marine Corps brings to the battle. Everything we do is going to be compressed in time and space because we're putting an angle on a show for everybody. We we'll normally do this when you, we don't want you to see us, but today, obviously, it doesn't do us any good to have all these people out here with nothing to see. So you've got to see it. We do it mostly at night because we own the night. That's when we like to fight. We're not looking for a fair fight. We're looking to go in there and, uh, pardon my French, kick enemy's butt and bring all of our soldiers home. That's what we expect. That's what my family expects of me and what your family would expect of you. The Marines here are putting on a show for the community and for officers from all over the world. Thank you. What we want to do is concentrate our combat power so that we can hit the enemy where they're the weakest and we can exploit that weakness to take advantage of it. The show of readiness builds support with the public, but it can also influence a much smaller audience. The Commandant of the Marine Corps and our Marine Corps headquarters is located at the Pentagon. When our representative goes into the tank, they call it, with all the other service chiefs and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, when they want to pick a force 
that uh, that is ready to go, very expeditionary, can be moved very lightly, but uh, but have a lot of combat power when they get there for an initial enabling to get in, open the door up, and hold for uh, for the moment at hand. I think that uh, I think that we play very well into that role. The day's grand finale is a reenactment of an urban combat exercise, among the most dreaded forms of any combat. Uh, he finished his company. In a mocked up tactical village, the Marines have been trained to fight where civilian and military casualties can be highest. In this exercise, the bad guys are holding the town. The good guys initiate the operation to seize the city. The mini war features everything from tanks to aircraft to carry out the assault. a crowd pleaser. Not too surprisingly, on this day in North Carolina, the good guys win. But all the performance art is a rehearsal for the real thing. The Pentagon sends troops where it is told to. In 1992, it was ordered to deploy forces to Somalia on a humanitarian mission. Initially, there seemed little risk. Over the months, the situation deteriorated and tensions grew. Then it exploded. And so when a firefight developed, during which tragically 18 Americans were killed and a large number were wounded, when that fight came, it was such a shock to the public in the tragic Black Hawk incident, Somalis brought down two helicopters and the rescue mission went drastically amiss. The nation and the Pentagon reeled. General John Shalikashvili was sworn in as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff just weeks after the Black Hawk incident. He inherited a nightmare. I think what went tragically wrong has haunted us really quite a bit ever since, was that we went to Somalia having explained very clearly to the American public why we were going and what we intended to do there. But then, as always in a military operation, things change. Nothing is ever static, and just because you made a plan doesn't mean that the plan is going to be carried out like this. Somalia brought back memories of failure and tragedy in Vietnam. All right, let's mount it up. Over the next years, there was little appetite in the U.S. for rushing troops in just anywhere. You know, in past decades, our country's had a wonderful margin for error. We've had big oceans, and we've had friends on the north and the south, and we could, uh, we didn't have to be Johnny on the spot. We could, we could hang back and wait and see and look around and then decide if we wanted to do something. The threat has now reached U.S. shores. Major Billy Hutchison, the pilot who flew over the Pentagon that day in September, is now flying protective cover over the nation's capital. I never thought in my entire career I would be in a combat air patrol over my own home. That's kind of an unnerving thought, you know? You never want to have to think, well, when I get up out of bed today, I'm going to be sitting above my house with live weapons defending this country against something that may come this direction. And there's the Pentagon. See the Pentagon out there? On this clear day, there are no enemies in the skies over the Pentagon. But no one is ready to let down their guard. Almost seven months after the September 11th attack, the Phoenix Project is still ahead of schedule. So much so that they are having some problems getting construction supplies in on time. Still, the signs of progress are everywhere. Okay. Uh, this is the part that was really uh, damaged quite badly. All of this area was uh, basically destroyed, blackened, the doors were blown apart, uh, uh, glass was shattered. Uh, 
the ductwork hanging out of the ceiling, and so all of this has been completely reconstructed in the last few months. And we're hoping to open the cafeteria March 1st. Uh, people are really looking forward to it. Not too far away from the renovation site, two flights below ground in one of the most closely guarded rooms in the entire building, an elite group of Army personnel is gathered. This is a Pentagon war room. Where you are is in the Army Operations Center, and it's here where the Army does its planning and issues its orders to its forces. And we follow an agenda that's on the screen there, and it starts out with a detailed understanding of an, the intelligence picture itself. What are our adversaries doing? What, are we, what do we think they're going to do? And we try to be as predictable as we can. The new enemy does not have an army or navy that the Pentagon can overwhelm. It is difficult enough to even find them. Intelligence gathering and secure communications are critical in this new war. The Pentagon has incredible tools at its disposal. Military and civilian satellites can send back images like this one of the strategic Kandahar airport from more than 400 miles up. But even this remarkable technology can only do so much. It is the state of the human intelligence gathering that has the Pentagon concerned. I worry about intelligence. I worry about our ability to know what's going on. It's a big world. It's, it's, uh, it is very difficult to find individual people. The intelligence capabilities right now, at least in my view, they're no, they're not right where we need them to be. If the FBI has a queue or the military has a queue somewhere due to some of our interrogations of some of our detainees, that those queues fly very quickly to other agencies and that they can cross queue and say, ah, oh, now I see what, what's developing or I see this linkage that I never saw before. And that can lead to other trails that uh, either for law enforcement purposes or for prevention purposes or for military purposes could be very, very useful. As enemies of America arise and find ways around its sheer military might, as terrorists have, the Pentagon will be challenged to devise methods to meet those threats. Combat is a giant game of rock, paper, scissors. You bring a rock against the other guy's scissors, so he comes back with paper to wrap your rock, so you bring scissors against his paper. That's all military technology is, is a continuing evolution of what does the other guy have, how do I attack it, how does he respond to my attack. One of the most important developments is the UAV, the unmanned aerial vehicle. They were first used with mixed results, but they are fast coming into their own. Over the next decade, I think that UAVs are going to revolutionize American war fighting in the way that computers and satellites have in past decades. Uh, we're getting there, we're just not there yet. Flown by remote control, the drones, as they are sometimes called, can hover over a hostile area, staring at it for much longer than other aircraft. One of the things that's enabled us to be very successful in Afghanistan is uh, we have air superiority uh, above 10,000 feet over Afghanistan, so we can put aircraft, uh, some of our long-dwell unmanned aircraft, over these targets with sensors on them that allow us to, to stare at a target for a long period of time. At times, they can deliver the information almost simultaneously to the field commander and the Pentagon. And in the 21st century, information is power. In the information age, mass is not a strength, it's a vulnerability. The bigger you are, the bigger target you are. And in, in a battlefield which has 24-hour surveillance over it, which is what the United States now brings with these unmanned aircraft, like Global Hawk and Predator, you become simply a sitting duck out there. And that's what I think the Taliban and their allies just found out much to their regret in Afghanistan. UAVs have another major advantage. There is no pilot to be shot down and killed. The rush is on to weaponize the drones. At least one has already fired a missile in Afghanistan. The ultimate unmanned air vehicle on the drawing board is the UCAV. By 2010, it is expected to make its own suggestion about what to attack. 
and after an OK from its remote control operator, fire at its target. Disquieting or revolutionary, this increasing automation of warfare is expected to continue. In the midst of the most grueling of construction schedules, the Pentagon hosts a lunch for the renovation project crews. An appearance from the secretary caps the event. I was told you never stopped working. What's going on? Few would argue it's a well-deserved respite. The new part of the building is not luxurious, but it is bright and clean, and clearly beginning to come back to life. You look like you need some help. We're all done. We wanted to see the new cafeteria. People who were blown out of their offices seven months ago wander over to see the progress. Yeah. Just go down uh, quarter three here, and it'll be off on the right, down by C ring area. Okay. We were, we used to be in that part. Right. That way. We right. crawled out of there. Is that right? Yeah, Did you really? You <laughs> we didn't even know you could get this far anymore. Oh, yeah. As early spring replaces the pall of winter, mayors from all over America gather in the Pentagon's center courtyard. ...who share the grief of this tragedy. We've come to honor and remember those who lost their lives. The rapid rebuilding of the Pentagon is a testament to the strength and courage of those who have returned to work here. Work here for all of us. A 53-year-old sheet metal worker from Delaware who lost his son, his only child, in the September 11th attack is among the many who put in 10 to 12-hour days here, six days a week. He came here to mend his broken heart, as well as this building. Within the building, the military way of life continues. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice Chief of Staff, Army. General Jack Keane is now under consideration to become the Army's Chief of Staff. He is here today to swear in Staff Sergeant Chris Brayman, who's re-enlisting. He had just finished a phone call. Brayman's comrade in arms from the 11th, Ted Anderson, is here as well. He evacuated the building under orders like everybody was told to do, except he turned around and came back into the building time and time again. And you recognize you're actually doing something larger than yourself. And it gives you a sense of purpose. And then you have this intense shared experience with people of value. And that adds such a dimension of quality to your life that you're changed by it. And it, it, it's the people and the mission, I think, that keep us here. Congratulations, Sean Brandt. In many ways, the Pentagon is defined by its sense of shared purpose. The whole thing is styled around how we would act if we were in the battlefield, where really we, we don't want anyone to fail. We want, to, we want everyone to succeed because everyone's life, life is at stake, and my life might be saved by the guy next to me. That animates the way the Pentagon works. You focus as hard or harder on those things that will have an impact, not for you and the people you work with today, but for the people and the people in the military who come years from now. The leaders here are mindful of the difficult and dangerous mission ahead. They exist in a universe where matters of life and death inform every decision, every act. So I don't think we should be under any illusions about what, what kind of world we live in right now. And that's why it's important that we, we can't build fences big enough to uh, defend ourselves. I think that's one of the things September 11th told us as well. Now we can do a better job, and I think we are in that regard, but we've really uh, got to go on the offense in this particular fight. So what one has to worry about is, is seeing that we stay ahead and that we work harder and smarter and faster at finding those terrorists and the terrorist networks and stopping them before they 
they have the opportunity to gain access to those kinds of weapons and kill uh, many multiples of, of the people that were killed on September 11. The Pentagon was created to deal with one of the most terrible expressions of the human race, war. Its success or failure, however measured, can affect the future of nearly every country on the planet. Fear it, respect it, look to it for protection, or desire its destruction. Much rests on this stolid, serious place, a grave and simple building called the Pentagon.